Let's go to a question, first of all, from Galen in Cambridgeshire, who asks, my question is about your views on penal substitution and salvation. When you've raised criticism on this topic, are you, A, simply trying to bring balance to the discussion about our calling here on earth and where we go when we die, or B, saying that the traditional understanding of penal substitution is not correct and God did not actually require Jesus to die as a sacrifice for sins. Let's start there, and uh, there's a follow-up question. Sure. Um, I, I think there is a sense in which I'm trying to do both of the things that Galen mentions, but I would want to say my primary task is to expound what the New Testament says about the meaning of the death of Jesus. And as I do that, speaking as a first-century historian, I'm trying to understand what Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, thought they were talking about. And as I do that, I find that different ways of talking about Jesus' death in the last 2,000 years have sometimes got hold of some bits of what's in the New Testament, but then missed out other bits and then produced distortions by emphasizing some things in one way and, and not rather than another. So I'm not simply starting out there in the tradition and trying to correct things. I'm trying to take a run at it from the New Testament again, which actually has been my life's work to say, mm -hmm. let's just read the Bible and see where we go with that. <laughs> but um, Clearly, there have been distortions within what has been called penal substitution. And for me, quite a breakthrough in thinking about this some years ago was realizing that the phrase penal substitution can mean quite different things to different people according to which story you put it in. If you have an element of a story and you frame it within one narrative, it means something quite different. You know, supposing you see somebody walking down the street and carrying a briefcase. Um, it's a very different sort of thing if actually this is the briefcase that that Russian spy was carrying two minutes ago and mm -hmm. they just passed in the street from if it's um, um, a man who left his briefcase at home and his wife has kindly brought it to him. So th the same thing can mean something different in a different narrative. So penal substitution can be expressed in very damaging ways. And even when preachers don't intend to do this, it is quite clearly the case that this is how many, many people, particularly young people, hear it. Mm. The idea being that there is this big, bullying, angry God who's very cross with us all, and he's got a big stick, and he's about to lash out. Unfortunately, somebody gets in the way, happens to be his own son, so that somehow makes it all right. Mm. And phew, we, we get off. Now, last year or the year before, I forget, I had a, a, a public discussion on this um, with some, some colleagues in America. And uh, one angry theologian got up from the floor and said, nobody believes that, nobody teaches that these days. <laughs> and one of the colleagues on the panel stood up, answered it for me. He said, I teach first year undergrads at a certain college, which I won't name. He said, what Tom has said is precisely what they all think mm -hmm. the gospel is, and they're struggling to know whether to believe it or right. not. So now, if that is what people have heard and are hearing, then we've got some serious work to do because we have taken John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And what people have heard is God so hated the world that he killed his only son. And then... When you say that in a world where there is child abuse and domestic violence and so on, people think, I know that bully of a god and I hate him. And then the whole thing goes horribly, horribly wrong. <laughs>